right. Can everybody um, see the PowerPoint slides okay? All right, good. Um, thank you so much, Darren, for uh, that lovely introduction. My name is Suryan Yoon. I'm assistant professor in cultural studies department here at Lingnan University. Um, uh, I'm more of a researcher of performance and performance cultures in Korea and East Asia in general, particularly paying attention to um, racial and gender politics. And so you might wonder why I'm giving a talk on Squid Game, right? Um, I think I'll need to first clarify why I'm giving this talk today and uh, perhaps more importantly, why this particular event is hosted by the Master of Cultural Studies program here at Lingnan. Uh, once again, I'm not a media studies expert nor a researcher of Squid Game more specifically. However, any discussion related to the show and its popularity inevitably evokes my own lived experiences of growing up in South Korea in the late 1990s, when the country's financial crisis brought earth shattering consequences. By the way, uh, for those of you who haven't noticed, I am from South Korea. I was born and raised there. Uh, yeah, so uh, the 1990s financial crisis and neoliberal redesigning of economy are the backdrop of the stories of many characters in Squid Game that we all have grown to like and hate. Uh, I'm sure we all have very strong feelings about all of the characters that we've seen. I'm asked to shed light on why Squid Game has come to tell these stories of abjectness, precarity, and violence from the perspectives of a native informant, if you will, especially as there's a growing number of Hong Kong-based viewers interested in the show who are left wanting to know more about its broader sociocultural context. So many thanks to um, Master of Cultural Studies program, especially Darren Long, who has invited me to share some of these insights. Um, so watching the celebrated Netflix show Squid Game, which recorded 1.65 billion hours viewed in its first 28 days, according to a CNET report, immediately transported me back to the year 1997 when I was 16. Um, I had just started my first year of high school that year, becoming part of a bandwagon to a long marathon towards the university admissions test, otherwise known as Sunung. Um, a success in the exam meant a guarantee of a spot in an elite university and a future life of stable middle class comfort and social privilege that Squid Game characters also collectively seek to achieve. Later in November that year, the Kim Yong sam government announced that South Korea was officially placed under the International Monetary Funds Management. Uh, otherwise known as the IMF crisis, an outcome of what we now know as the 1997 Asia financial crisis. Sparked by Thailand's currency pegging failure, the Asian financial crisis set in motion a chain reaction that affected countries like Indonesia, South Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, as well as Hong Kong and Taiwan, many of which had relied on export economy and foreign debt. Its immediate impact resulted in the foreign capital flight, devaluation of Korean won, Korean currency, and general economic recession. It also prompted a nationalist campaign calling for all Koreans to contribute to paying off the nation's debt by donating gold to banks. In return for the IMF's 58 billion US dollar bailout package, public services and business had to be privatized deregulated and structurally readjusted, costing hundreds of thousands of jobs. Where would our lives go from here, we wondered, as we watched the news during our nightly cram sessions at school. I vividly remember talking with a classmate in the back of the classroom, trying to figure out what exactly was happening, what the IMF meant. But most importantly, how this would affect our immediate concern, which was college entrance. While some of the classmates' parents were directly affected by the crisis, many also went on as business as usual. It was the adult problem, not ours. And if we were trying to be helpful, studying hard to secure a chance of upward mobility was the way to do it. 
Perhaps the real life version of Squid Game already started when we all decided, to borrow David Harvey's words, to play the capitalist game and perform as agents of discipline in the process of late capitalist governance. So what you see in the slide is this was found in a junior high school student at desk, which means you know, if you earn one through three, which is the highest level in your transcript, you'll become a consumer. You know, the next level, you'll probably be, you know, cooking chicken behind the counter. And then at the bottom rung of the rank, you'll probably end up like a delivery guy. So this is kind of an internalization of the class hierarchy already, right? As a teenager, you're sort of internalizing the idea of this logic of capitalist game. So it is no wonder then that the game and the show Squid Game actually started in the year 1998 following the financial crisis. Squid Game is a ninth season Netflix drama shot and produced in South Korea, released this September. 456 contestants, mostly debt-ridden individuals living in abject and precarious conditions, are invited to compete in a ruthless battle royale or Hunger Game-like competition to win a, a 45.6 million U.S. dollar cash prize. And of course, you know, the idea of the death game in both Battle Royale and the Hunger Games dates all the way back to the second century BC in Rome, right, the gladiators. So this is a kind of the running theme that we always already see. Chun Ho, the detective who is determined to find out the truth about his missing brother. Oh, by the way, I haven't talked about this, but this, you know, my presentation has a lot of spoilers. Uh, and so if you haven't watched the show, uh, you, you know, I might actually suggest maybe, you, you know, you wait uh, until you actually see the show. Uh, and so uh, already there's, there's a spoiler. So Jun Ho, the detective who is determined to find out about the truth about his missing brother infiltrates the game and stumbles upon a vast archive of videos, ledgers, and documents that meticulously record the information of all of the contestants to date. While the camera quickly zooms out to show binders from different years, we're still able to catch a glimpse of the binders, such as these, from 1998 coming to shocking realization that cohort of the players that we just watched are only a fraction among tens of thousands of people who have already been killed before them. This was also the year when Oilnam, the player number one, who is later revealed to be a billionaire culprit behind the game's design, became rich by making money by lending it. Based on Ilnam's monologue, it's not hard to imagine how, the, how he accumulated his wealth through money lending and possibly loan sharking. Following the IMF-driven neoliberal restructuring and the subsequent global financial crisis in 2008, the amount of individual household debt in Korea has been consistently on the rise, primarily due to the increased dominance of financial market over government regulation and protection. As of 2021, the household debt levels have reached 1,805 trillion Korean won, which is the equivalent of 1.5 trillion US dollars, which is over 100% ratio to household income on average, which means that even if you had to pay off your debt by spending 100% of your household income, you won't be able to pay back your debt on average. So many individual account holders were also lured into opening up high risk, high return investment accounts with the promise of quick accumulation of wealth, which were primarily managed by investment bankers and wealth management advisors like player number 218, Sangwoo, um, a Seoul National University um, graduate uh, and a financier. Sangwoo's mother, who earns living as a fish vendor, thinks that Sangwoo, um, her source of pride, has gone abroad for a job, when in fact, he's on the run after defrauding many of his clients following a failed foreign investment venture. <laughs> um, okay. 
So Sanu um, contemplates suicide by burning charcoal, which is one of the more frequently used methods for suicide in Korea. The suicide rate once went up by a whopping 36.7% back in 1998. Scholars term the types of these suicide cases, quote unquote, social suicide, because the majority of these cases were driven to death by poverty and business failures following the financial crisis. But of course, we're also able to witness, albeit indirectly, another instance of social suicide and social killing in Squid Game. Unlike Sangho's personal misdeeds, the main protagonist, Ki Hun, player 456, is an unemployed loser and social outcast who leeches on his ill mother and ex wife. Viewers gradually come to learn that Sangho has racked up debt from loan sharks after he was laid off as an automobile worker in a failed restaurant business. Here, the show does a weird jump from depicting Ki Hun as a useless washout to a righteous social justice warrior who is still traumatized by the death of his colleagues during a riot police crackdown on the labor strike. As the lights go out in the dorm in episode five, Ki Hun is haunted by the memories from the day of the tear gas filled mass strike when his friend was beaten to death by the riot police. It isn't difficult for any South Korean viewers to associate this story with the Sangyong Motor Company, which was merged to conglomerate Daewoo in 1997 before it was subjected to corporate dissolution in 1998 due to their debt and financial mismanagement. While Sangyong Motor Company was able to recover during the early 2000s, it was eventually bought by Shanghai Automobile uh, Industry Corporation, whose management relocated the resources and technology of Sangyong Motor Company to mainland China, while neglecting to protect South Korean workers' wages and benefits during the 2008 global financial crisis. Workers went into an indefinite strike in 2009 with a bloody crackdown in the summer of that year. Over 900 workers were laid off as a result with several hundred of them pledging to go on an indefinite strike. Between 2013 and 2018, some of them were hired back following a series of legal disputes, but many also committed suicide by the dozen and the struggle is still ongoing. While we're invited to learn about the diverse dimensions and the backstory of characters like Ki Hun, there are many missed opportunities in the season one of Squid Game, especially with its focus on women, queer, and immigrant characters in general. This has prompted a debate on the representational politics of women in gender dynamics. The debate is mostly not known to international viewership outside South Korea, but the dissenting voices have come to emerge, especially on social media platforms like Twitter. When women in their 20s and 30s who advocate for feminist causes have called for boycotting the show. The main point of contention here is the seeming misogynistic representations of women, especially with the use of their sexualized and victimized images. For instance, many Twitter users took to the platform to criticize Han min character, a scheming femme fatal figure and player 212, who shamelessly uses her sexuality to advance to next levels. Her strategies are described as quote unquote unrealistic. However, I personally don't necessarily agree with the idea that Han min behaviors are simply unrealistic. In fact, another character, Ji Young, and her sexually abused childhood only reveal that women's bodies in general are always already on the heteropatriarchal spectrum of sexual objectification, bartering, and transaction. While Ji Young was forced to realize the nature of women's bodies as violable at a very young age, Han min appears to be someone who is already familiar with the idea that women's bodies are sexually viable and therefore can be used as a currency in an extreme and dire situation. 
So to simply suggest that Han Minya is an unlikely figure in our everyday life runs the risk of erasing and suppressing various women around us who have been socially and economically conditioned to choose to use their sexuality in transaction largely in forms of sex work and sexualized care work. Regardless of the differences of opinions on what constitutes misogyny of Squid Game, the more important question is whether there is indeed a variety of dissenting opinions and more complex discussions emerging in response to the show. For instance, those that call for boycotting or call out some of the points of critique can be often shot down by more zealous, at times nationalistic, responses that support the success of Squid Game. Even though critiquing Squid Game does not necessarily deny or disavow the strength of the show, there is an apparent lack of more nuanced and dissenting conversations that go beyond a simple one-dimensional point about its capitalist class politics. The lack of more nuanced conversation can only be compounded by the fact that women as well as immigrant characters and their lives in South Korea seem to be leaning toward a very one-sided, even stereotypical narrative. Women around Kifun are largely understood as those that seek heteronormative middle-class domestic bliss. In the case of his neighbor and Sangho's mother, as well as Kiun's ex-wife. In fact, however, we do not know what ki ex-wife has been through all these years while supporting her husband's labor rights until she decided to uh, get a divorce. According to research in 2018, 48% of Sangyong Motor workers, spouses, and other family members have contemplated suicide and expressed that there is a stigma and burden shared by the entire family members. Therefore, if anything is unrealistic, I'm tempted to say that the show falls short on depicting the lives of family members, especially the spouses of the workers, while making gendered assumptions about Kiwan's wife as a symbol of capitalist upward mobility. In the case of Ali, player 199, and a Pakistani migrant worker, viewers are left with even more one-dimensional images of a migrant worker, that is, of his credulity and subscription to respectability politics. He's a hard worker, he never raises voice, is willing to save the life of a fellow player while risking his own, and can be readily deferential to any Koreans. While I agree with the recent NPR comments on how Ali's almost unrealistic deferential and subservient attitudes may be actually a survival strategy that comes from years of being mistreated and abused in a Korean factory, I also see this as a projection of the director, Korean director's own guilt. That is, the anxiety to do good to minority characters on screen because they're mistreated in real life. However, the Korean guilt only ends up becoming a patronizing gaze at the migrant worker's figure. And we'll never know whether Ali indeed was a strategist or simply a gullible person because he was killed off before revealing a more complex side of himself as a fellow human being. Taking into account the matter of intersectionality, perhaps the most interesting character is Sebyeok, player 67 and a young North Korean defector. She is a both, she's both a woman, but also an outsider to the South Korean society in which many North Korean defectors have hard time adjusting and assimilating. For Sebyeok, her journey to and living in South Korea have already been a real life version of Squid Game, only without the cash prize. She has most likely had to escape her hometown, swim across the river, dodge the Chinese police, survive sexual assaults on many occasions, and earn living by petty theft while looking for ways to reunite with her family. Um, there are, these are the ordeals that many North Korean defectors have to survive if they're lucky enough to not get caught by North Korean soldiers or Chinese police who will send um, all the North Korean defectors back to North Korea where they will get jailed. 
which is why Sebyeok's untimely death comes as a surprise to many viewers who would have rooted for her win despite the show's avoidance of a more optimistic tone. These missed opportunities, and I'm reaching my conclusion here, these missed opportunities only call for season two, with which we wonder, will we get to see more complex dimensions and resilience of people who survived years of abject living, thereby showing us a glimmer of hope for humanity? Or will we find ourselves trapped in a nightmarish cycle of Squid Game again, never knowing how to undo the system unless we become vengeful vigilantes like the front man who doesn't trust the police. It seems like it's a critique of the system and authority, but in the end, the mistru deep mistrust in the system also uh, shapes this idea that because the system doesn't work, I have to take it to my own hand. So it sort of cultivates this vigilante idea. Or maybe uh, we become vengeful vigilantes like Kihun, uh, who decides to uh, supposedly go back to the game. We never know. For what it's worth, it's mirroring of the current political economic conditions and the under-addressed gender and racial tensions makes the show a surprisingly generative site of discussion. I'll end on that note, and I look forward to expanding on this in the discussion. Thank you. Sit in the uh, Can everyone see us? Is it too dark? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we move to the next section. Uh, thank you so much. The presentation is very fascinating. Um, I think that you have gave us a very, um, uh, very rich so social and cultural context about South Korea and help us to know, understand more about what what is happening in Squid Game and what is what is under or behind um, the squid. <laughs> so uh, it's a good way to untangle the squid. <laughs> And uh, I remember, um, oh, you have mentioned um, David Harvey, right? And the reason I, uh, I initiated this talk about Squid Game is a group of students uh, who present David Harvey's book, <laughs> and then they use Squid Game as um, as opening. And then I, I really like that uh, presentation. And then I tell them, don't don't spoil. <laughs> I have just I have just watched first first episode. And uh, um, well, I finished it. I finished all. <laughs> yeah. So and then after the presentation, I I finished it within like a few days before other people keep telling me about that show. <laughs> but I like it, and it's really uh, exciting. It's really exciting to see the competition, but also very cool. And and after the show, I I was thinking. Uh, is there any um, thing I can't see from the show? But for example, you show the the, the cap screen about uh, the protests, about why there's so many like male figure who are like losers in the society, and at the same time you saw lots of like bling bling genre, bling bling drama in in careers uh, in K-pop, right? So it's quite interesting to to see. Um, more and more this um this kind of figure male figure failure figure uh from from k pop so um no that's my that's my reason to to um i like this show and also um uh, uh to to organize this talk and then now we have a dialogue we have a student dialogue with um uh, professor hoon and please come Yun, sorry, Professor Yun. 
So uh, let me introduce uh, two of our students, Yong, please come, and also uh, uh, Hanoka, all right? Just come here, Hanoka. Um, uh, I guess while they get ready, maybe I can respond okay, to your yeah. question very quickly. Um, as uh, yeah, I think that's uh, a really interesting observation, maybe very, you know, quick three points, um, you know, in response, and then we can kind of expand that to our students' conversations. Um, but one is uh, that, you know, we always have to consider the discrepancy between what's presented, right, as a pop cultural representation outside uh, of South Korean viewership versus uh, what gets to be represented inside. And so while, you know, you know, of course, we all talk about globalization, this globalization, that, um, there's always this lag or discrepancy that contributes to what gets noticeable in the Hong Kong context and in, Hong, uh, in Korea. And of course, uh, then there is this idea that while it, it appears to be that these male characters are becoming more predominant uh, in the K-pop, K-drama cultures, uh, at least in Hong Kong, it's actually not the new phenomenon in South Korea, right? Especially since the, uh, you know, the long term of economic fluctuation, uh, especially this figure of a helpless patriarch, right? Who's struggling to understand this like changing society. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, Parasite is now used as the um, standard reference to everything. But, you know, for me, at least, right, Parasite is one of many, many other or long kind of lineage of pop cultural products that have kind of uh, addressed this issue. So there is a very long history of these representations that we need to take into consideration. And then lastly, of course, while there is a predominance of these male characters, uh, we seem to forget that the majority of pre precarious workers or unemployed people have been women, right, who are now pushed into the service sector uh, or invisibilized care work, uh, you know, something that isn't necessarily, you know, taken into consideration when it comes to these popular cultural representations. And so um, we also need to remember that there is a discrepancy between, um, you know, these precarious women workers versus these struggling patriarch. Yeah, so. That's amazing. I always done a lot when I watch a lot <laughs> Korean drama. But um, all right, let's move to the dialogue. And I want you to introduce um, two of our students. Um, Ayong. Ayong is our MCS. Ayong is our MCS uh, graduate, MCS master, master program of um, culture study. So she is our undergraduate uh, and she's now working in a research team in our department. And then uh, Ameno, Ameno Hunoka, right? And she is an, is an exchange student um, in our university from Japan, from the University of uh, Wa Wasada, Wasada University, Zodo Team Daiho. And she's taking, she's taking your co course, right? <laughs> All right, interesting. So uh, maybe uh, should should you begin first? Yeah. yeah. You can you can speak with the mic. Yeah. Okay. Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> okay, so it's just like okay. um so what's in the movie? Just like the survival of the fittest competition involving the society is too harsh. In the movie that um in the movie that aspect like the like harsh competition was descriptive exaggerated exaggeratedly and in the real world of capitalism we are also always under pressure of competition at least i maybe many of many people and personally born in 2001 and living in japan i've been um also lived under the huge pressure and there is always a fear of falling behind from others, like dropping off from the so-called happiness life um, path. Like in Japan, it is um, determined by the way where people graduate from good university and get a good job and get married and have children. Um, so not only the fear of dropping off, the future vision itself has not been what it has been nowadays. And we're really precarious. And 
um, as an individual from South Korea and also a professor of my favorite class, I want to ask you that how do you position yourself in the um, um, in this capitalism world and the context of Korea and also in the world? And also what has made you to lead your life so far? Wow, what a big, big question. By the way, I'm not going to give you more grades because you <laughs> said, <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, no, I always appreciate um, Honoka's question. By the way, this is an excellent question, if not very, you know, big and, you know, uh, pro you know, provokes a lot of different questions for me. It's very hard to respond because it's also personal, right? Um, as I have already talked about in the beginning of my talk, I've seen my, uh, you know, friends, parents kind of struggling with the business, um, you know, uh, very tragically. I've also seen cases where their fathers have committed suicide because of the business failures. And so I have to say, I was part of the generation who has been um, you know, at least maybe internalizing this, now the very rigid class hierarchy uh, and this idea of precarity, but also we're sort of, you know, hardened to this, you know, way of brutalization of our everyday life, right? So how I position myself, of course, is not actually to accept it as is, but, you know, as I have mentioned in the last portion of the talk, um, I think it's actually important to, you know, seek more organization uh, and the chances to mobilize our voices as much as possible, even as we feel that we're isolated. Uh, and I, I talked about this in class the other day, but more and more uh, the digital and online transition happens, we also feel isolated because our precarious conditions are never really made visible, right? But I think despite that, I think that only calls for the need to, you know, seek uh, political mobilization. And I don't mean like this massive labor strike that we already seen from the PowerPoint sites, right? But um, as you can see from the feminist groups, right, uh, there are, you know, various kind of minoritarian or minority uh, uh, moments of raising their concerns and to recognize that you're not the only person who's going through this, right? Um, you know, in fact, what's really interesting is that everybody is feeling a very similar abject, you know, uh, emotion of, you know, helplessness, and I don't know what to do in the future, then, you know, why don't we actually share that and, you know, try to find an alternative that could work for everybody, right? We can't necessarily think about that. And then, of course, you know, it might sound as if this is very ideal, but I think this is also a very practical solution, especially when we're living in, in the condition, present condition where uh, mobility, political mobility and organizing become very, very difficult. So how do I position myself? Um, so, so thinking that this to be um, a very important agenda and cause for whatever I do, whether it's research or teaching, I, I think I try always to incorporate these ideas, right? Um, you know, even if the system appears to be unbreakable, you know, there's no exit. Uh, we shouldn't actually accept the particular idea. We should actually always already find an alternative space in which to reject the rule of game. So I talk about that, you know, either in the classroom setting or in my research or in my talk. So that's at least of, you know, the things that I would do as a scholar. Yeah, so hopefully that kind of responds to your question a little bit. My reflection. <laughs> um, oh no. Okay, um, so I did share my feeling toward my future or what am I feeling um, under the pressure of the competition, the capitalism, I did share with my um, friends really personally, but um, your response got me the idea of sharing to more people, sharing to more people, like not only the friends, but also like nowadays um, using the, the digital technology, we have a lot of opportunities to share, reach to the um, wider range of people. So Maybe I'll try to um, um, 
give my opinion on Twitter or Instagram tonight. Yes, I'll do this. <laughs> uh, yeah, just very quickly. And then, of course, you know, this doesn't simply mean, you know, this isn't uh, simply to say that, oh, you know, you should just, you know, take all of these to the digital, right? Uh -huh. But rather, I think what my point was that the conventional idea of political mobilization, just like what we see from the early 2000s or mid 2000s through these mass strikes, uh, actually the formats of these protests and political mobilization are changing all the time. And that's good, right? Because it shows that we are also able to diversify the ways in which we're able to raise our voices, right? So I think uh, whether and how we can find ways to diversify our political mobilization are, you know, uh, constituting the most important question that we have to ask ourselves. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I prepare a question. Um, we know that there are some wonderful female characters in the Squid Game, and I was uh, very touched by the friendship between the two young girls. Um, but the female character that impressed me the most was a game loser without face and name. She only appeared once in the lines of a staff member who said, I'm, I am sure the cops wasn't a man because my colleagues and I slept with her. It means that this poor woman was brutally raped after her death. So due to the plots like um, this, uh, like you mentioned, some Korean feminists try to boycott the Squid Game and they believe in this uh, misogynistic TV show. Women are being objectified, discriminated, and experience gender violence. So um, as for me, I'm disappointed that female character like Han Mina uh, need to be I need to exchange men's protection by Seth and uh, Zabelk, who has excellent survival skills, but she also had to sacrifice for the two men's final battle in the end. She, uh, uh, her death become, became a narrative tool. Yeah. So I was so disappointed that the director didn't seem interested to let the players organize a movement, maybe a Me Too movement or a labor movement to repair the game organizer. But also at the same time, uh, we know that the female situation in the real world seems not better than the squid game. We're still facing inequality and violence. For example, the females still have fewer education and job opportunities than the male. And the case of women being killed or sexual assaulted is also increasing. So that's my question. My question is, how can we evaluate the Squid Game? Is it really misogynistic or does it really reveal the reality? Um, yeah, thank you. Another very important question. Right off the bat, my response would be, for me, it's not very productive to simply ask whether this is misogynist or not, but rather how is it, what kind of job is it doing to either diversify the stories of women characters uh, or what kind of focus is it giving to certain aspects of gender dynamics or gendered everyday life, right? So of course, you know, if we start to apply whether this is misogynistic or not, all cultural products are in fact very misogynistic, right? So unless we all go out and refuse to watch anything, which is also, you know, which can be done, you know, if you choose to do that. I, I also support that movement if you would like to do that. But I think what would be more generative and productive for us is to ask questions like, you know, compared to Ki Hoon's, you know, diverse dimensions of his backstory, are we actually seeing, you know, same amount of attention given to other, you know, female characters, right? Uh, or I necessarily, I actually don't really agree with the idea that, you know, Hamina character only seeks male protection, whatever, you know, she's a very smart character, right? And she doesn't necessarily think it's so bad to take advantage of that gender equal inequality, right? What disappointed me was actually she sacrificed herself um, at the end. <laughs> Why wouldn't she just push, push him? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of echoes this like, you know, um, 15th, 16th century uh, folk tale from Korea. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but, you know, there's a folk tale about this 
uh, um, uh, Sang, which is a female entertainer who sacrificed herself by uh, uh, harnessing a Japanese general who invaded Korea by killing him by uh, jumping into the river together. And so it kind of reflects this, you know, female sacrificiality again here. So, you know, why don't we just, you know, keep Haminyo as is, right? The bad, you know, shameless character, you know, what's going to happen to her? I, so I thought that was the missed opportunity when it comes to portraying uh, Haminyo characters. And of course, right, the examples that I showed uh, in the talk that were a lot of these missed opportunities um, that could have gone to a more productive opportunity. So I would maybe ask a different question than, you know, is this misogynist or not? Um, you know, rather we should start to ask, you know, what kind of conversations or nuanced discussions is Squid Game actually generating for us, right? With this as an opportunity, are we able to move beyond this very one-dimensional uh, discussion about class politics and start to incorporate intersectional questions about gender, about race, uh, about queerness. I, what I didn't talk about is also the, the representation of gay uh, identity, like same-sex uh, perversity that seems to be this underlining kind of idea of these powerful men. Uh, and so there's a lot to be had. So if that discussion isn't necessarily being generated, maybe that's a problem. So hopefully that partially responds to your yeah, question. Yeah. Wow, such a very fruitful discussion. Um, but we have got a lot of question already oh. too soon. But uh, before giving a chance to the question on soon, I want to ask, now we are in the Q&A session. <laughs> so um, do our audience have any question here? All right, maybe in this a little bit time to think. So now I, I will take the question from Sun first. Okay, cool. Let me arrange it. <laughs> How are we now? Uh, I think we can overrun a little bit, like uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so the first question from uh, Tsai, Tsai Hua. Um, his question is, uh, you say a bit about a bit more about uh, the political mobilization today in South Korea. Yeah, that the show may be touching on, if any, please. Okay, the first question is this. And then the next question, the second question is um, an, uh, from Xiao, Xiao Chun Song. Um, she, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Great presentation. And uh, okay, that's what he said. I'm from Literature, <clears throat> Literature Translation Institute of Korea. I'm a Chinese. I'm a Chinese and now living in Seoul, Korea. So far as I know, Squid Game is not so popular here as it outside Korea. Will you please talk about why there is such a kind of differences inside and outside Korea? Thank you. And then the, do you take it? And then the last question, the third question is from Professor Poon. <laughs> so maybe we we kill these two questions okay, first, okay? Right. Good, good, good. Uh, I'll respond to the second question first, and then the first question. So the second question was why the difference between the popularity outside versus popularity in Korea. So first, I think we need to define what we mean by popularity. So uh, are we uh, talking about the number of viewers or the number of hours that are spent in uh, watching this, or are we talking about the cultural consumption. So as cultural studies folks, we're always interested in how, uh, you know, uh, the practice of watching Squid Game, but also practice of buying merchandise, practicing, you know, Taiguna game, the, the playground games together outside the show also constitute a way of popularity, right, for us cultural studies scholars. And so if the person who asked this question is also referring to that, I think uh, there might be two points to consider. One is that um, I think it is popular in Korea in terms of the number of viewership or the number of hours spent in watching, but the cultural consumption side of it isn't necessarily considered to be very desirable um, because uh, one, there are other priorities of cultural consumptions to be made 
in addition to Squid Game and perhaps, you know, uh, uh, joining the bandwagon to this international phenomenon uh, doesn't necessarily seem to be such an attractive idea. But more importantly, the thematics uh, that Squid Game uses, once again, are not necessarily new or novel. Uh, it's a, you know, repeat repertoire. Um, you know, that is used over and over again. So I don't mean that it's cliched necessarily, but you see many different iterations of the, this repertoire kind of playing out. And so that sort of evens out, right? And then as uh, the Squid Game still gains popularity, we still see other K-dramas that are produced in Korea. And so quickly, I guess that's, that's part of my response to that question. Second, uh, political mobilization, that's a pretty big question, I think. Um, but I might have to respond to that by saying, and then I think, um, what was your name again? Uh, Ao Young. So Ao Young has already pointed out, but there are other you know, forms of political mobilization, such as Me Too movement, or a feminist organization, or even, um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, protests and political mobilization concerning the um, legislation of Anti-Discrimination Act in Korea right now, once again, which is not necessarily known to the outsider viewership. Uh, and this has a lot to do with intersectional concerns of anti-discrimination of, you know, gender, race, ethnicity, and religious uh, and sexual orientation based identities, right? So this has been going on for years because now Korean politicians are very hesitant to uh, represent these minority voices, even though they're not really minorities. In fact, there has been a national consensus amongst people to call for the quick legislation of Anti-Discrimination Act, which is not really happening. And so there have been a lot of protests uh, lately that respond to that, which isn't necessarily, I guess, portrayed in Squid Game. But I think the director's perhaps aim is not to show these dimensions, but rather really highlight the brutality of capitalist game of logic. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um... And then the third question is from Professor Poon, Professor Poon Ngai, and she said, very insightful sharing. And uh, thank you. And could you please help, could you please help us to understand how Netflix as a big capital also consume the working class culture mm. and cancel out the potential working class solidarity reflecting the cultural logics of late uh, capitalism. At the end of the subject. <laughs> I can't really respond to the huge question, uh, especially because I'm not a media researcher who pays a lot of attention to Netflix. Um, I think what I think is that, you know, it, it would be problematic if we simply focused our concerns of the international working class solidarity and cultural representation of them only on Netflix, even though Netflix is, yes, um, one of the you know the largest uh, global streaming sites. It's not that Netflix is the only uh, site or uh, production company that have been part of perhaps uh, you know this current or patterns that work against um, the cultural representations of working class uh, narratives. And of course, right, uh, we should also question what we mean by working class narratives. Right? Uh, is it you know, still problematic if we find Ken Loach's movies about, you know, precarious British workers on Netflix, right? Is it necessarily going against it? Or are we, you know, uh, only kind of rooting for a very avant-garde minoritarian experimental narrative of working class representations and solidarity outside these streaming sites? And so I think the question about what, what do we mean by uh, working class solidarity and cultural representations and logic of their subjectivity. What do we mean by that should probably be um, explored more, um, even before we get to the question of what does Netflix do? In fact, I would say Amazon, uh, prior to Netflix, really kind of contributed to and shaped this particular environment. Um, 
both in terms of cultural production and also its actual factory floor, right? We now all know that Amazon workers are mistreated. Mistreatment is an understatement, right? They're, they're exploited uh, forever. Uh, and so how does Amazon or perhaps these global streaming sites actually mirror each other in terms of these practices might be another question, my response, right? uh, in response to that question to build upon that perhaps uh, is something that I would like to talk about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought of, um, well, you, you was asked me like, why you uh, notice this goes to a working class, uh, more and more working class figure in, on the popular culture? It's still a question, like, why we notice it? Why? In a particular context, we we have found or we connect more and more to those figures on and and stories. It's a question. It's not an answer. <laughs> All right. So, um, is there any question from the floor? Yeah, please. Um, yes, Mark. Also, we you can ask uh, your questions in Cantonese Up to and you. Mandarin. I can yeah. translate if you. Uh, more comfortable with your own language, you just speak it and then I can translate. Up to you. Uh, okay, I, I, I've tried to express in English, maybe. I have seen the Parasite and uh, Squid Game, and I found they, they are both focused on uh, to present the capitalism in a very uh, depressive uh, tone or depressive uh, scene. And I think, is there any way to imagine to critique uh, Capitalism in a not so depressive way because I don't I I think uh, it's more and more popular to press to express the capitalism in a depressive way like the Hunger Games like the, the and it's becoming entertaining in some way so maybe that is losing its effectiveness. I think what you're suggesting is really interesting. So um, first of all, let me start. Uh, off by saying that if you're interested in Bong Joon Ho, the director, um, the director of Parasite, oh, uh, yes. Bong Joon Ho's earlier works also deal with capitalist class structure, and they're much more playful. There is a lot of humor. Uh, you can still laugh about the ordeals that the characters go through, uh, and it's still a critique, right? So of course, right? Uh, what do we mean by depressing or what have you? But I think. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that our attention is always already reduced to parasite only, and you know doesn't necessarily show more of playful aesthetics of Pong Jun Ho's earlier works. So, works like um, I don't know the English title of the movie, but it's um, uh, in the Korean title is Perlan Da Seke. So you can you can check it's it's from like 2002 or something. Uh, but that also shows like the middle class politics, like the loser character. Uh, actually, the loser character in that movie is uh, the intelligentsia. So like us, right? The the adjunct professor <laughs> who is trying to um, get a tenure job, but he's always dismissed because of his like inability. And then there are women characters who are always precarious, but it's very, very playful and humorous. So there is a way to um, experiment with our humors in order to tap into the brutality of capitalism, which I think you right, rightfully pointed out because people are now probably addicted, unfortunately, to the highlight and focused attention to the violence only. So sensationalized images of capitalism and what they do. And unfortunately, as I mentioned at, at the uh, end of my talk is that then that lead us to critique capitalism only from the vantage point of vigilantism. So the idea that, oh, you can't do anything about capitalism, so you'll just you know, take things into your own hands. So you'll you know, start killing people out in the street. Uh, you know, that's not going to solve, right? And that only perpetuates the idea that we can never mobilize a collective voice. Uh, and so, yes, the focus on brutality absolutely, I think, is kind of shaping um, you know, unfortunately, sort of the popularity of these films. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Very interesting question and answer. And uh, when you talk about like a little bit like um, alternative representation of working class culture, actually, 
uh, th I sorry for I have to apologize for uh, Professor Poon's question because she has a second part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she asked, like, uh, what is your view on uh, I co uh, I co op in I C C uh, I C O O P movement in South Korea because that is a different form of like um, cooperative, like cooperative in cooperate co cooperative in in South Korea and workers work there and they have different sort of working culture um so i i think what professor poon is talking about is one of these many what what we call in korea uh so it's a form of cooperative entity that is not a private corporate business or government-run organization it's um uh, founded upon shares uh, that are contributed by you know, consumers or other citizens to support the movement. I would have to say ICOOP is one of many alternative groups, um, small and large. And I believe they also have like a storefront. They they sell stuff or products, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, um, once again, I, I guess as a cultural studies person, I always resist this question of, do you think this is an alternative or not? You know, is this misogynistic or not? You know, is this, you know, a good critique? I, I guess I resist the question of yes or no. But people are always um, looking for alternative, right? Like, yeah, and I want to difference? mess that up. You know, I want to kind of complicate <laughs> that by suggesting that actually there are so many grassroots organizations um, ranging from alternative schools that work uh, outside the public sy education system where they teach more of you know, intersectional education or decolonial education, like local gra grassroots movements to these more practical kind of uh, uh, solutions to mo mobilization that supports the livelihood of workers. I think there's a wide range of uh, collaborative efforts that are being made. So while I can't definitively say that these are alternatives or not, I think the mere fact that these alternatives can exist is very important and perhaps paints a template for the kinds of alternatives that we can all collectively dream about. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking like uh so called well is this if you're not if we are not just focus on focus just focus on so called the alternative, but if we look at the representation, actually there are lots of I mean the, the existing representation of working class culture is, is quite diverse. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, we have mentioned the, depre the depressing image and also like very competitive, like cruel image about um, the working class world, social world, you know, how cruel it is. But there's also the image or also other uh, story about working class culture. For example, um, there's a, TV program, I think it's a series. It's called Answer the Call. Answer the Call from uh, 1984 or 18, oh. you know? In, in the story, including different families who are working class and they live to, together. In like reply series. Yes, right? sorry, reply yeah, reply 19, series. 1988, 1994, that's Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Especially the first one, you know, the, uh, um, a bunch of working class family uh, parents with uh, children, they live together and they how they share the resources and how they be smart, even though they have less resources, all right? And I think there's a different form of um, representation about working class. Just sure. Uh, although I do have to say that I'm personally not very fond of the Reply series, especially because it always ends with this like fantasy yeah. of middle-class good life uh, it definitely is based on the producer's own uh, class background. He went to Yonsei, uh, I think. Uh, and so all of the characters that uh, act as protagonists either end up at Yonsei, my alma mater uh, as well, Yonsei or Seoul National University, uh, or, you know, these kind of iterations of these elite university. And so it's kind of, and also it sort of then subscribes to this nostalgia that like back in the days, it used to be better, like whether you're from, you know, a poor background or a rich background, you can always kind of hang out as friends. Neighborhood. 
right? Yeah, neighbors, social capital right. is there, um, and we don't have now. Yeah, like yeah. That, right? That's a fantasy, right? Of course, you know, there are fluctuations in which, right, we have formed our sociality very differently in the year 2021. But to say that, you know, they want to kind of recall these memories from 1994 as if they're very hopeful and rosy and like, as long as you get to Yante University, everything will, you know, you'll get a boyfriend, right? <laughs> um, so, so I think that then kind of complicates mm. the idea of the representations of middle class or middle class people. Actually, we do have this kind of like a reply story in Hong Kong. For example, uh, you know, the, the, the original story about Lion Rock, the Lion Rock story is about uh, different uh, working class people, they, they live in a very like small share house and then they have a good neighborhood to, to help each other, something like that, you know. That's how people remember the old day, the Lion Rock spirit, <laughs> the good neighborhood, even though life is hard, <laughs> was hard, yeah. How are we on time? Is that? Mm, I think. Is there any question from Zoom? Oh, maybe that will be the final question. That uh, we obviously felt the misogyny in this drama. And then I would like to ask a question. Uh, does this um, situation or this um, uh, the narrative is come from the status of women's social uh, situation or space in Korean society uh, in reality. Uh, because I have seen those uh, very conservative uh, voices in mainland China, uh, they in order to suppress the feminist movement, they will precisely cite the situation uh, of Korean and that they will say that, uh, it is because the opinions and actions of the feminist movement are so radical in some time in Korea uh, that many men have deliberately re retaliated, uh, which had caused the women to face even more cruel conditions in South Korea. Uh, it is easy for us to understand that it is not true. Uh, so can you please uh, tell me a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, good. Great, great question. Um, two things, I'm not really sure if we have time, so I'll, I'll make it very quick. Uh, I think there are two points to be considered. One is, uh, I think the director actually believes that he was trying to portray how horrible Korean men are. Um, like, you know, you see these very obvious scenes where men like discard women because they're not useful uh, or whatever, right? But for me, that obvious treatment of gender equality is the precisely the trap we fall in. So by thinking that, you know, uh, Korean men are, you know, this horrible, but we don't necessarily go beyond that particular idea, right? So, so what? Okay, so, you know, you know, there's a horrible gender dynamics. What do you want to propose next for us to consider? So, you know, there, and, and then of course the idea that, you know, these men are really horrible in Squid Game, this is a very basic, thing that everybody can get on board with, right? Everybody is um, disgusted by these, uh, you know, horrible behaviors of men, but then that doesn't necessarily lead to a more expansive discussions around gender dynamics or gender inequality, right? So it kind of stops short at there. So yes, it's a portrayal of this brutality of the current state, but you know, is it doing more than that would be the question, right? And then there is, uh, what, what's really interesting is that although it seems like the mainland conservative voices are citing Korea, this idea of, oh, feminists have caused this on themselves is actually a repertoire that has been used over and over again in the US, right? In the 1970s and 80s, in Europe, in, in uh, Asia, many parts of, in, in Ireland, so in many parts of the world, there's always this emergence of dissenting voices, and then there's a victim blaming, right? So, you know, this is all you're doing. So actually, it's important for us to recognize that this repertoire is a recycled repertoire that's used by conservative right wing, and sometimes very masculinist and hetero patriarchal voices, which then disempowers, right? The, the seeming uniqueness of, of these mainland uh, conservative voices. Uh, and at the same time, I think 
uh, obviously that's not true, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not women's fault, uh, you know, that call upon this violence against them. However, we, what we also see, and this is something that I generally talk about in, in my talk is that South Korea is uh, now um, facing its presidential election very soon in February. Uh, and what's happening right now, which is becoming a major concern is that the right-wing politicians are actually latching onto this, um, you know, male centric voices, thinking that they would gather more votes by being purposefully anti feminist or promoting misogynist narratives. And so uh, you see that happening uh, even within this very mainstream political representations where women are blamed for their own ordeals. Yeah. So, so it, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon that mainland uh, conservative voices are citing that particular uh, uh, event, but uh, we also have to recognize that this is a globally shared sentiment amongst the, the conservative politicians as well as mainstream media. Yeah. Well, great. Um, we have we have overrun, <laughs> and there's one more question from Sun from 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 Sun, but we. Uh, maybe I can respond to that yeah. individual. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. If you, uh, people from Zoom, if you have more questions, you can send email to us and see, send email to the professor, uh, So Young, to So Young, and um, let's see. So now, uh, thank you so much for your uh, participation. Yeah, and thank you for coming to our event on a Saturday, um, no less. Uh, and so, yeah, I really appreciate all the questions. It also makes me think about other issues that I probably need to look up. Yeah, more it's more. not just about South Korea and because we are interested in it outside Korea. So there must something we, there's must something happening or significant in our own context. So reading, like when we watch Squid Game, talk about South Korea, actually we can know more about ourselves or our society as well, right? And uh, okay, last word. Um, I think um, we can organize more uh, public talk like this through some easy um, uh, structure, you know, like a <laughs> quick game to talk about the uh, more interesting and radical and even hard issues, right? So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for organizing. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.